Maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. If we cannot inspire the country to believe again, then it doesn't matter how many policies and plans we have. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. It's time that we define our policies. It's time that we define our sentencing guidelines. The total is out of 100%. The first quality we are looking at is that unique idea. It's out of 40%. Your confidence, the way you stand, the way you present yourself, that amounts to 20%. Clarity, the way you're explaining yourself in a logical manner, that accounts to 10%. Your research, sources that you have. So it's not just ideas that you're sharing, but you've done a bit of research because this is your idea. 20%. Time utilization, you've used five minutes very well, adequately. That amounts to 10%. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. So thank you so much indeed. Um. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me this opportunity. A little field mouse was lost in a dense wood, unable to find his way out. He came upon a wise old owl sitting in a tree. Please help me, wise old owl. How do I get out of this wood? He asked. Easy, said the owl. Grow wings and fly out as I do. How do I grow wings? Asked the mouse. The owl looked at him haughtily sniffed disdainfully and said, don't bother me with details. I only decide policy. Today, I will be speaking about the reasons why the youth in Kenya do not participate in leadership and the ways we can remedy this. As Kenyans, we have this tradition of complaining about our leaders. Well, let me continue this fine tradition today. Po politicians, just like the owl, are content to tell you, fly out of the forest, but they are unwilling to show you how to grow wings in order that you may fly out of that forest. As, as Kenyans, as a youth, I have often laughed when I've heard this statement, the youth are the leaders of tomorrow. It seems to me that to, the, the future is like heaven. Everyone exalts it, but no one is willing to go there now. Everyone knows that the youth form a majority of the population of this nation. Everyone agrees that the youth should be part of the solution in shaping our country. But no one has any idea how we should do this. Would you as a person be willing to be operated on by a person with no medical knowledge? Just as we are unwilling to be operated on with people with no medical knowledge, so should we be unwilling to let the future of our country rest on people with no leadership training. We have all agreed then that as the youth, we should be trained in leadership. How then do we go about this training? I thought about this topic over and over again. I searched my mind and thought, how should we be trained? I thought, let's go to the politicians. Then I remember the quote by Nikita Khrushchev. Politicians are all the same. They will promise to build you a bridge even where there, is no reason, where there is no river. Therefore, I decided as the youth, we should be the instigators of the change we want to see. We have a foundation in our country of youth initiatives that are functioning very well, although we, do, we as the youth do not really join them. I pose this question to the audience today. How many of you belong to any organization that deals with youth matters, be it just a debate club that will discuss the problems that the youth face? Therefore, I say to you, 
join an initiative today, talk about the problems our country faces, and come up with solutions. A mustard seed is the smallest of seeds when, it, when watered grows to become the tallest and strongest of plants. Therefore, we should nurture the idea of participation in our youth initiatives in order to make them something big in this country. I have a very exciting uh, example for you. We look at it, the recent history in Egypt as a revolution that, that occurred out of a small idea that was nurtured by the youth of that country, the people my age and your age. What then is stopping us as the youth of Kenya from forming initiatives, going to parliament and saying, we want to be, the, to be part of the leadership of our nation. These youth initiatives could also sponsor us to go to parliament and watch the policy makers in action. Wouldn't you have been very excited to be there when the marriage bill was being debated? Wouldn't you have loved to be there to know how this marriage bill came about that will affect your future life? I would have loved to be there. Benjamin Disraeli once said, the youth of a nation are the trustees of its posterity. Therefore, I say to you young people, stand up and demand your right to be leaders of the nation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, please forgive me for my taste of fashion. I'm still working on it, but hopefully that uh, my speech will be better than my choice of green and gray. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Shaman PC, and today my topic is about death in Africa due to preventable and curable diseases. Um, two statistics, both from the World Health Organization. In 2008, 4.1 million children under the, end, under the age of five died from preventable diseases. In 2002, 564,300 people in Africa died because of preventable diseases. This is not, these are not diseases, for example, um, HIV or, or cancer. These are preventable diseases that people are dying from every day in Africa. And I would like to talk about the, the, three, ma the three main reasons why people die from these diseases and, the, and solutions. The, 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 the three, oh, sorry, the three, um, main reasons is ignorance of health and hygienic lifestyles, the limited access to health facilities, and poverty. Let me start with uh, ignorance of health and lifestyles. Ignorance of basic health and health principles lead to people dying from preventable diseases. This uh, can occur when people uh, use water from the river to both to bath and to, dr and to drink. These um, and they do this while not knowing that the water is tainted with disease. Poor sanitation, such as not washing hands before, they, uh, before you eat, can also cause people to die from preventable diseases. And I believe that this is one, of, uh, one uh, major reason concerning why people die from, from preventable diseases. The second reason is, to, is the limited uh, resources of health facilities. A limited number of health facilities also contribute to people dying from uh, preventable diseases. In many cases, people cannot go to attain these, um, or people who attain preventable diseases are not able to get the appropriate health services and uh, health services they need. For example, the only hospital in a certain rural area might be 30 or 40 kilometers away. So the time it takes to get there and, uh, and considering maybe the few number of medical um, personnel who are there, it leads to many people dying from these uh, medical, from these preventable diseases. And um, a few facts: um, in Kenya, in 2011, there was 0 0.2 physicians per 1,000 people. In Vietnam, there was 1.2 physicians to 1,000 people. Now, as you can see. We, ha we need more personnel in Kenya to be contributing to the health of our people. And uh, finally is poverty. Now poverty is one of the main contributors to people dying from, from preventable diseases. People just can't afford, po uh, sorry, can't afford healthcare. For instance, uh, in town as I was walking, I, I saw someone, uh, a man sitting on the ground begging 
with a huge growth on his stomach. And instead of being in a hospital to be treated for maybe what was cancer, he was reduced to sitting and begging for money. A great majority of people in Africa cannot um, attain health care just because they can't afford it. And this should not be the case. And so I'll quickly move on to the solutions. Um, concerning um, ignorance of basic hygiene and health principles, I would propose that um, children, children in um, schools are taught health, health principles so that when they go back to their parents who many did not attend primary school, they'll be taught about these. Um, another, ex uh, another solution could be maybe having small conferences where women come together or women, I mean mothers come together and learn about these so that when they go back to their families and to the communities, they're able to spread this information around. For the limited uh, number of health services, I believe that the government should, should give incentives for private, private hospitals to be placed in rural areas, such as maybe lower tax and subsidized um, or subsidations, which can really help um, make it affordable to have many more, um, many more, uh, uh, healthcare facilities. And the final one for uh, concerning poverty would be an affordable medical insurance. In Rwanda, uh, they have been able to reduce the average health spending by half um, for the common person. And so these are my, are my main three solutions to battling preventable diseases in Africa. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lavenda Okore. And today, I'd like to talk about a problem. It is a problem. If not carved, it will bring forth more problems. And if solved, I believe it is able to solve all the problems that have been talked about and that are yet to be talked about. So I'll start from this point, whereby it says that it is the shoe wearer who knows where it pinches worst. And I'll illustrate my problem with a brief, a brief story. I, I was in a school in some part of Africa and in this school, I was a person who believed I'm always an achiever. When it reached time to do some exam, to do it and do what, when we went into the examination rooms where revising, you'll find that there's a section of students who are taken aside and being this thing that is coming normal in Kenya nowadays, everybody is about leakage, leakage, leakage. And you find that it is not so important to get the leakage. But you could find that these girls come into your room, your examination room, maybe room one and room two. They spread, they look at what you people are studying, then they gather and start laughing. So you know, you just like they have been given the leakage, you are like, oh my God, I'm not reading the, life, the right thing, this and this is happening. And so you'll get derailed, even if you are the best performer, you'll get, end up getting maybe an A minus and you are to get an A because of that confidence. So for that, I'm going to talk about the education system in Africa, specifically maybe Kenya and East Africa. So you find that it has got three main aspects. We have the training, the evaluative base, and we have the performance. But I will majorly talk about the evaluation and the performance. Like now, you see there are very many universities mushrooming. There are very many colleges being granted charters to be universities. But is this really going to be a solution? Because right now, the degree is becoming nothing. Everybody is owning a degree. Everybody is starting to look for masters and PhDs. Well, these people, everybody will be having PhDs and masters. Where will they go? Will they be productive to your economy? Is it really sensible? Or we are just going to flood people with degrees, but they don't have an opportunity to use their, their whatever they have gotten or their skills? Is it really quality? That's a question that we really have to focus on. Because you find that not everybody, the, the rate of examination and assessment, not anybody who gets an A is right. Not anybody who performs according to the evaluation system is able to be creative and grant the nation what we want. I talk about, uh, yeah, as I'm going to, again to focus on, maybe look at this ratio, whereby there's only one assessment. When you bring in the humanitarian part of it into you and you think about the other people, there's, you find that maybe at the second level of education, we are only examined once for the national level, we are examined once. Think about this person who, around that area of sitting exams gets an accident or encounters any other sort of calamity. They are going to be judged by what they do because they're not able to maximize their potential at that level. 
but they are going to be judged by this one grade and this one examination that we have. This is not really fair. So I'll have, for that, I'll put across the following recommendations. The first thing, continuous national assessment at various levels, because according to the 844, you'll read for eight years, you'll be assessed once. But when we have the continuous, maybe let's say you read for maybe two years, there's a national, or three years, there's a national assessment, you'll be able to see and compare the results. At this year of assessment, this person was at this level. At the next assessment, the person was at this level. When you get the average, you'll always, always be able to find out this person has this potential. This person doesn't have this because maybe of this and this reason. Apart from that, I'll also recommend the second stage whereby we can incorporate like create other units. I'm glad some universities have incorporated some core units like critical thinking and everything. But if you put this in the second level and the first level of education, whereby they'll be able to understand the logicalness of something in its whole. Why I need to learn and understand the skills, the relevance of learning, and not being obsessed with grades and grades alone. We'll be able to have people who come into the university with ideas, who come into the university with a goal that they know they want to achieve in life, and are able to transform the country to the next level, and are able to be productive, more productive, and change the system and the status quo of grades and grades alone in our country today. Thank you. Uh, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I was having a small talk uh, the other day with a lady friend of mine who works at the feeder. And this talk kind of digressed to a sensitive issue that is dealt with in our country now and the world over. I'm sure most of you can relate to this, especially the boys. When you were young, when you touched a doll, when you cried, you were told you're becoming a sissy. When you showed emotions, you were told that's weakness. That is for girls. What were they telling us? Were they trying to tell us that weakness is synonymous to being female? Is that right? I asked myself that question. Then along the way, as I grew up, I got to learn of two words, affirmative action. It came in Kenya and it escalated. So fast, it culminated into the girl child having the upper hand. Look at this room now. Look at the population of Strathmore. Strathmore has 62% of its students who are female. UNICEF puts the population of the youth in Kenya at 75%. 61% of these above 18 to 34 are female. So much research has been done extensive research, oratory and written, that focuses on the girl child. So many opportunities have been created for the girl child. Now more than ever, the tune changed. Before we used to say, what a man can do, a woman can do. Now ask any small girl, what a man can do, they'll tell you very confidently, a woman can do better. Which made me ask the question, if all these resources, if all this time, if all this energy and all this intellect is focused on the girl child, who is fighting for the boy child? Haven't we just flipped a coin? In 2050, won't we be having NGOs and governmental organizations fighting for the boy child? Who is fighting for the boy child? This is a question that most of us never look at. In Kenya nowadays, you brand your NGO focusing on HIV AIDS and the girl child, and it becomes a gold mine. Most of the NGOs we have have become a business venture. 
merely by focusing on the girl child. Open an NGO and focus on the boy child and tell me how long you'll last. Tell me how many donors will even look at your papers. When you are in Form 4, you know the grades that are required to go to university. We would say it's fair. And we would say in the spirit of equality, everybody deserves a fair chance. But if you put the girls' grades lower than the boys to give them a fair chance, aren't you saying they're weaker? So you give them an advantage over the others. I believe each one of us, regardless of our gender, is born with innate capabilities. Boy or girl, man or woman, you have your innate capabilities that you're able to achieve given the right opportunities. You don't have to be a man. You don't have to be a woman to be a CEO. You don't have to be a man. You don't have to be a woman to be a member of parliament. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr. in his legendary speech, I have a dream. He says, I have a dream that one day my four little children shall one day sit in a land where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day when all of you will be lucky to have children, boys and girls, they will not be judged by their gender. That your boy child in the future will not be fighting for rights because everything, because everything we did now focused on the girl child. Thank you. All right. Um, from my side, I must say it's been a tight day in terms of competition, and I must say you guys are, are very talented. But uh, as my colleague has said, um, the choice of your topics, I understand we had a unique idea, confidence, clarity, research, time utilization. We wanted to see a lot of your inborn talent. Yes, we have topics, yes, but uh, we want to see your skills. It's all about, we want to hear you, we want to see what you know besides that topic you're presenting. But, for today, I must say, uh, you guys are amazing. It's been very tight. From number one, from when we, we, we started at around two, from the first person um, to the last person, amazing, amazing team. So I think uh, keep up the spirit. And of course, um, Mokazi is coming up with the, with the criteria how the winner is going to be chosen. Keep it up. Thank you very much. Are we ready? I loved somebody said, if you want to hide something from a Kenyan, you put it in a what? In a book. He was partly right. I think if you want to really hide something from a Kenyan, put it in the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the one person who's going to represent Strathmore University in the academy and the second division of university speaking is the one and only Sharil Rasul.
it's an honor once again. Thank you so much for being here after this particular time, 10 minutes conversation. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your sacrifice. And we appreciate. Thank you for the good work. Round of applause. Another beautiful round. some of these illegal injunctions. If we cannot inspire the country to believe again, then it doesn't matter how many policies and plans we have. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they have committed themselves to that over that. It's time that we define our policies. It's time that we define our sentencing guidelines.